Welcome, Anne. Thank you for having me. Well, um, before we get started, Anne has kind of a rude question to <laughs> ask of all of you. It's the atypical question for the crowd, but very common for me. How many of you have spat for me before? <laughs> How many? Okay, okay, oh, so not, that a, many. A, a decent, not too many. Okay, okay. so we, we kind of need a primer. You, you, everybody has them in their, in their kits, at, in their rooms. Mm -hmm. Tell us what a 23andMe package is. Yeah, so we, I launched 23andMe with this idea that the human genome is the most exciting thing scientifically that is happening in our lifetime and that we should all be aware of this and we should all follow it. And so very cheaply, um, there's a new technology that will come out that we are able to take advantage of. So through a very simple saliva test, you are able to go to 23andMe.com order a, a little box, a saliva kit. You spit in the saliva kit. Um, it takes anywhere from five to 10 minutes. It's that much spit. Um, you send it back to us, and um, anywhere from two to eight weeks later, we send you an email that says, welcome to you. And the service is intentionally based on the fact that we do not know everything about what the genome means, and that I know some things really well today, um, I know things like cystic fibrosis associations, the BRCA association that Angelina Jolie had, um, and we have things like ancestry, like really fun things um, to play around with, um, but that it's, it's gonna be a journey, and we're gonna keep discovering things over time. And so even today, the, one of the top stories of Yahoo News um, was that there is a discovery about genetic associations and uh, propensity for drinking coffee. So I thought it was interesting because I, I literally go to bed dreaming about my coffee um, 12 hours later, that's gonna come soon. And, um, and there's a genetic association study. And so part of it is like, how do I engage you with your genome? And every single month, there's new things coming out that are gonna interest you in your genome and help you understand why we're all different from each other, but why we're all so similar, and how can you actually potentially be as, you know, know as much about yourself as you want. So 23andMe, the company, actually has sort of two lives, as I see it. So there's the pre-FDA letter and the post-FDA letter. Um, the pre-FDA letter, uh, somebody would take the test and get 250 reports on everything yeah. from your risk for various diseases, what kind of adverse reaction you m might have to drugs, just a really intense um, description. Um, then you got that threatening letter fr from the FDA last almost exactly a year ago, and now you've had to really whittle that back. So describe what people can get now mm -hmm. and where you are with the FDA. Sure. We, we, launched, um, we launched originally back in 2007 with 12 reports. And um, you know, it was, it, people were nervous, like what is, how are people gonna respond to this genetic information? And very quickly after we launched, we got encouragement from the scientific community to just give as much information back to individuals as possible because it was so exciting and so interesting to watch. Um, November 22nd of last year, we got a letter from the FDA asking us or telling us to stop giving health-related information back to consumers and that we are a medical device and we need to file as a medical device. So we are no longer um, providing health information back to individuals. We are, to, for instance, in all of your bags, you have the saliva kit, um, you spit in that, we will give you back your raw data and we will give you back all your ancestry information. Um, and there, you can do anything you want with your own raw data in your genome, so you could look up information yourself, but 23andMe is not allowed to tell you um, to draw those associations for you right now. Uh, we did submit to the FDA a, um, what's called a 510K package. It is on a single association, so we did have 250 reports, um, so we've essentially given a submission package for one report, um, and we are hopeful that we can at least establish through that report a path so, forward. And, yeah, moving forward with the FDA. Um, meanwhile, of course, the, uh, the, you've gotten a $1.4 billion NIH grant. It shows you how psychotic government can be. Um, <laughs> I've learned that. <laughs> <laughs> on the research side, so, it, and all of this fits in kind of with your original vision of 23andMe, which was about collecting data, big data, that can be used to fight disease at, at the end of the day. Uh, can you talk about those research sure. uh, efforts? A founding mission of 23andMe was that this concept that if we, if I had all the data of, you know, if I had all of the data of the world um, about how you live your life, your genetic information, that I would, you know, not just really understand disease, but I could just transform 
fundamentally how we approach wellness, prevention, um, drug discovery. And so, um, you know, today we, we do research studies in, in these sort of little fiefdoms. And my father is a particle physicist and he loves big data and big numbers and big accelerators. And um, we watched, we were looking at this clinical trial once, there was a TV show about it, and he's like, like people don't understand these, these numbers. Like, you can't run a clinical trial with like a few hundred people. You need thousands and thousands of people to really do it right. And the problem here is that it's just, it's financially impossible to actually run a clinical trial the way we would all want it to be run. And I think, frankly, the only way we're actually gonna get to the kind of knowledge that you and I all want in this room is if we crowdsource it. That no, realistically, no one, no one pharma company could ever run a clinical trial with a million people. And fundamentally, we actually want that kind of research. So, so this idea is that um, you, know, you can empower, 23andMe can empower you with your information, your genetic information, your medical record information, to be part of this community where collectively we're all gonna solve the problem. And if I look at any of you, you might have migraines, you might have had some kind of cancer, you might have, you know, be a really fast runner, you might love cilantro. Um, you can contribute data about not just one specific condition, but you can contribute about hundreds. And the average 23andMe customer has contributed to over 230 genetic studies. So it kind of just shows that like the this, this system that we have today where you're part of a study, it's at Stanford, they own your data, it's only used for that one specific thing, it doesn't make sense in this world. Like you should actually make, you wanna own your own data and then you want as many researchers as possible around the world to be getting access to that because you want as many smart people in the world to be trying to make these discoveries. Like it's hard problems to solve. Like why do we get cancer? Why do some people have multiple sclerosis? It's not obvious. So we need lots and lots of people to have tons of data to try and solve those problems. And the other thing is that most important is that you and I, we care a lot more about not having the disease than about treating it. And so I would like, I'm relatively healthy today. I would like to stay as healthy as possible. I'm not as excited about having you know, an effective treatment for you know, Crohn's disease, I would just rather not ever have it. And the problem is the healthcare system as we know it today functions based on the treatment. And no one is really putting that much money into prevention. And so frankly, if you and I, like we care about our own health, if we care about it, then we all need to mobilize and rally to actually have this, this aggregate community of people where we're making the discoveries about the lifestyle and the prevention. And it drives me crazy, for instance, you know, a couple weeks ago there was a story uh, about butter. It was the cover of Time magazine. And like, butter is now, it's okay. It was bad, and now it's good. And like, it like, it's kind of drives me crazy. Like these big studies, like, is it good, is it bad? How should we eat? Low fat diet, low carb diet. Like, like if we can actually all pull that data together, we can actually have a more like scientifically sound, intelligent path about what are the right ways to really prevent disease and what's the optimal way for people to live. And you have hundreds of thousands of customers. We have so over, it's a lot of over seven hundred and fifty thousand customers. That's a lot today. of data. I want to bring the audience into this, even though it's a short interview, because it's so interesting. I'm, I've always had that, that issue of, do, do I really want to know what disease I'm going to get um, based on uh, genetic mapping? But what thoughts do you have about taking part in this? Right there. Hi, Lynn Dougal. And as I sit there and listen to you, I was just wondering, are you working with IBM and feeding all this data into Watson? <laughs> <laughs> Are you a medical device? And are you <laughs> um, we, um, w I mean, we should. We have a we have a big team of individuals that are um, crunching this data. And I, I always joke because we're we're in a Google building, and, and the first you know year that we launched, we had some Google people come over and they looked at our server, our single server, and they're like, well, "Call us in a few years, and we'll come help you." Um, and now we actually, with 750,000 customers and over 200 million data points on all of our customers we have a tremendous amount of data to, to be processing and to be making sense of. So one of the things that was important for me is I don't want just the 23andMe researchers to have access to this data. That if we're gonna fulfill our mission, if you have, you know, if we have a sarcoma community, and those people who have sarcoma, who came to 23andMe and trusted us with their data, it is our responsibility to make sure as many 
qualified researchers in the world can get access to that data in like a relatively easy and expensive fashion. So we are creating what we call sort of this research portal so that anyone in the world could, could run queries on our database, including Watson, and, um, and, and crunch us to make discoveries. What diseases do you think 23andMe could have the most impact on? That's a great question. I actually think lifestyle. Um, I mean, I think that people who, it's one of the things that's most interesting to me is that, um, and how I got into genetics was this idea that you have some, you're, you're, everyone's dealt a certain deck of cards, but then there's this whole lifestyle component. And if I could really understand the lifestyle component, then I could have an impact on my health. Hmm. So in some ways, like type 2 diabetes is one of the most exciting diseases because there is a genetic component of it. But if you, have, if you modify your behavior and you modify how you're living your life, you really can do a lot to prevent the disease. So I'm pretty excited about, and I think that's where, like when I look at customers, like they want to understand and prevent those diseases. One of the other things that's just really interesting, I see another question, is that we, we find people which what we call sort of these escapers. Um, so in, it is an example. We have people in the 23andMe database who have two copies of the cystic fibrosis gene, two copies of the mutation that, that means they should have cystic fibrosis, but they don't have the disease. Hmm. So it's really interesting because it's, it's a question of like, why do these people not have the disease? And are they a potential drug target? And you actually have people like this. So for instance, there's a community in Pakistan where they're the fire walkers. They can walk, they feel no pain. They can walk on fire, they feel no pain. They analyze these people and they found that they actually do have a mutation in, in a gene and that is associated obviously with pain receptivity and that's being used now by a number of drug companies mm. for pain development. And more and more it's kind of the example of how like you might look healthy but you might actually be have two copies of a genetic variant for a rare disease but you're an escaper. And your data could be incredibly valuable to someone else. Mm. And that's kind of part of the reason why like we actually need to all bond together because you might be a solution for me right. and I might be able to do something that's actually helpful to you. That's fascinating. We had a, another question. Oh, a lot of them. My. Um, <laughs> right here. Is there a... My name is Janet Shamley, I'm from NBC News, and last year my colleague, D Dr. Nancy Snyderman, who was actually supposed to be attending, mm -hmm. um, were having a discussion that I had no family history because I lost my parents young, and she gave me one of your tests. This was pre-FDA letter, and um, it was incredibly helpful because it uh, gave me information about uh, the potential uh, for a disease that I had no idea, and now I can be proactive in regard to that, so thank you. Okay, right behind you. Hi, I'm Kelly from UC Berkeley, the other college in California. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I will spit once I know that I've eliminate, eliminated the copious amount of wine last night, because I don't know what your lifestyle feedback will be. But I'm, I'm very curious to hear about the demographic profile of your mm -hmm. spitters, because I have always understood that much medical treatment research is geared on the average white man, mm -hmm. which makes sense since, since we can cure erectile dysfunction but not breast cancer. Yeah. So I just wondered if your demographics, <laughs> I wondered if your demographics skewed <laughs> male, female, or was pretty equal. Yeah, uh, it, 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 that's great for this crowd. Um, we, uh, <laughs> um, we, uh, um, the, d the database is remarkably gender balanced. It's roughly 50-50. Um, one of the things we pay the most attention is to sort of socioeconomic status. Like, we get that question, like, are we just for rich people? Um, I used to joke that um, we actually are, are the, the economic status of our customers was not as high as people would have expected, but we had a lot more PhDs, which kind of showed maybe you shouldn't go and get a PhD. Um, but, but we have, with 750,000 people and at a $99 price point, we really flattened you know, access, like we really enabled broad access of this. We also did a program called Roots into the Future with Skip Gates where we gave away 10,000 kits to African Americans because most genetic research is just done in a uh, European population. So one of the challenges going forward is gonna be, you know, equalizing it between Asian communities, Southeast Asian, and, and um, African populations. We're out of time. I've got this everywhere in the room. So I really apologize. It's, it's a very short interview, but Anne will be here and um, seek her out. And thank you so much.
Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Nina.